Hi, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and welcome to the July 2013 Media Church Gathering. We're broadcasting from Alamosa, Colorado, and uh, they only have so much internet in Alamosa, Colorado, and they kind of have to spread it around. So if the quality of your connection via internet is not great, uh, fall back on the conference call option, which comes over the phone lines and doesn't depend on the, the, the bandwidth. And uh, for those of you watching by video, if the video is not a super high quality, we're, going, we're also recording independently on uh, video equipment so that we can make it available uh, to you later to make sure it is good quality. It's going to be an interesting media church gathering today because the Lord told me that cancers are going to be healed. Cancers are going to be healed. Usually we reserve ruling and reigning. Let me see. It's it's not the war room yet. We do that on the. It's not the third Thursday of the month, so we can't rule and reign until then. Well, actually, we can. And uh, this has been interesting because we saw a tremendous response of people registering for Media Church. Something's beginning uh, to happen, and we want to participate in it. And all of these uh, technologies, they're not perfect, but the whole point is about uh, bringing the church out. Uh, into the marketplace, out into the world, bringing the ministry, the anointing, making it accessible, downloadable in your life, uh, not just downloadable uh, from a technical standpoint, but downloadable as a metaphor for the anointing of God being dropped into your life on demand, accessible where you need it. That's what we're here to, uh, to speak toward. Uh, we don't have any illusions about the the quality of our broadcast or our, uh, the technical aspects of what we do, but uh, we've determined to keep things mobile. We've determined to keep them easy and accessible, and that's what we're here for, to reach out to those. You know, we have, uh, I heard somebody call this the other day, this type of ministry. They made a distinction between lo local church and mobile church. And I thought that was very interesting because theologically, uh, if you begin to uh, study what they call uh, ecclesiology, which is a study of the church, we have always had the idea of the universal body of Christ, which is made up of the saints throughout time, including those that Jesus led out of captivity when he rose from the dead, those righteous dead that he preached the gospel to while he was on the cross, all the way down to the very last person who will ever give his life to Christ when God wraps up human events. And then there's the local church. There's the church universal, and then there's the local church. And now we have another church. Uh, it's not like another testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not what I'm saying. But we have another um, venue for the expression of the church, and it's found through technology. And it's it's called the at least this this writer uh, in the he was a columnist for Ministry Magazine by Strang Publications, and he drew a distinction between mobile church and local church, brick and mortar church. You know, you can have a brick and mortar business or you can have a mobile or an internet based business. Uh, the internet, or if we use the word virtual church, those, um, the virtual or internet, those terms have a, uh, an inherent lack of credibility. And I really like the idea of mobile church because it's church accessible where uh, you need it. And that's the way the early church was. They used the technology of the day to bring the message and the anointing and the mission of Christ out into the world. Back then it was uh, Roman roads, which were primarily, interestingly enough, were primarily used by the military to bring Roman conquest throughout the known world. And uh, so 
uh, our modern day uh, example of that, the cutting edge of technology, is the information age that the book of Daniel talks about. It said knowledge would increase. Well, we want to ride that wave and bring the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring and not just uh, information that is coming at you one way like broadcast technology has been for a long time but to try and do something that is more than that it's bi-directional uh, and, and because it's bi-directional and we're working toward that making we're trying to find ways to make this more interactive because then we create agreement and when you create an agreement, according to Matthew 18, the scripture says, nothing shall be impossible to you. God's calling a church to rule and to reign, a body, of not, just, not just individuals. You know, as an individual, you're a principality and a power, and you have jurisdiction to get things done. But yet the scripture brings out the... Uh, the precedent of one should put to flight a thousand, two could put to flight ten thousand, and it goes on. In other words, there's an exponential increase and an amplification of authority if we can achieve spiritual community, it's not just spirit, not just religious community. We're not religion is a precinct in human civilization that's like the ghettos that Hitler put the Jews in. We want to put, you know, they quit killing Christians when they formerly recognized uh, Christianity as a religion. Uh, for the most part, wholesale uh, martyrdom in the early church, it came later in the Dark Ages, but in the early church, it pretty much came to an end when they said, oh, we know what you are. You are a religion. And then they said, well, then, then you're no longer a threat. But we're more than just that. We are a spiritual community. God is, I heard Graham Cook make the statement that, that God is, is uh, invested today in raising up prophetic communities. Now, when I hear the word prophetic, it's real simple. Uh, it's no more mystical. Let's demystify the prophetic, shall we? Uh, it's, it's no more mystical than hearing the voice of God and sharing what you hear for the benefit of yourself and others. The scripture says that the, the gifts of the Spirit are given to profit with. They're intended to be profitable in your life, not just uh, something to tear you down or to make you feel bad about yourself, but they're there to edify, they're there to encourage, they're there to build you up, and not just as individuals, but as a body of Believers and the Lord has been speaking to me about this building process. And I want to read a verse of scripture to you. It's familiar with all of us. And uh, the Lord woke me up with this passage the other day, and I want to bring it to you in the way that He instructed me and the way He moved upon my heart. Uh, Matthew chapter 16. We'll start with verse 13. We think we know what this passage says, but it's very interesting to look at what the translators did with what Jesus said and what he actually said, according to the, those uh, men of God who wrote the autographs, in other words, the original manuscripts. They used a, a wording that is not real clear to us by the way the translators have translated the word church, for instance. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus uh, came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and uh, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist. In other words, you're a, they were saying you're a reiteration of a ministry from the past whose credibility is unimpeachable. In other words, they were willing to accord to him a connection to the ministry of John that was universally unimpeachable in recent spiritual religious history of that people. And that was high praise. That was, it was very high praise for Jesus. Um, you know, they say that if you don't have credibility, you'll never fulfill your purpose in the kingdom of God. <laughs> of course, Jesus said in John 5, 44, 
Uh, why seek the honor that comes from man rather than the honor that comes from God only? In fact, credibility in the kingdom and credibility among uh, religious uh, uh, authorities are sometimes at odds with one another. You've got to determine uh, where do you want your credibility to arise from. Cancers are going to be healed today. Here in a moment as we move into this teaching, we're not just going to do it. We're not just going to talk about it. We're going to demonstrate it. We have a lady named Molly in Nevada. Molly in Nevada. She's actually registered for this broadcast. We're going to pray for her, but not just for her. Because how many know that uh, the letter C uh, does not have authority over the letter J? Uh, cancer... Uh, does not have authority over the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus transcends the C word, the cancer word. I've seen cancers healed. Uh, I've seen cancers healed in times in my life when I was anything but a spiritual giant. And I saw God step up because it's not about how good we are. It's about how good God is. Cancers are going to be healed. Because not because of what I'm going to do, but it's because we're going to have a moment today that we're going to become the ecclesia of God. And as the ecclesia of God in time and space, at this moment through this broadcast, you and I together are going to come into a Matthew 18 agreement and there's going to be cancers taken off of people. So you get the names of your cancer uh, victims uh, on a piece of paper because we can't call them all out. Uh, but we want testimonies. We've seen them healed. It's not about how good we are. It's about how good God is. It's about stepping into our jurisdiction, not just as individuals, but as a people, as a corporate body. And for this moment and this time, we're going to be that body. However many hundred of us are connected around the world in this broadcast, or perhaps you're watching this after the fact, because we release these videos afterwards. Let's believe God for what he's going to do. He said, some Jer Elias, uh, others say Jeremiah's the weeping prophet. Sometimes people uh, gild the heaviness of heart. They take heaviness of heart as though that is an anointing. Uh, Jeremiah cried rivers of tears. I, I remember a season in my life, I was going through tremendous heartbreak. And I would stand in it, and, and right when that was happening to me emotionally, the, the, God just blew the doors out giving me invitations to go and preach and speak and I would stand and I would preach and speak with tears running down my face and everybody thought it was anointed well actually I had something else going in, on in my life completely separate from that but uh, we tend to uh, get lend credibility to emotional release and some preachers are really good at that they, they put the tear put the tear in their voice oh God you know, because why? Emotional release carries a level of credibility. So they're trying to find credibility for Jesus in this conversation. You're Elias, you're Jeremiah, uh, you're John the Baptist. He said, well, who do you say? Who do you say that I am? Now, we're not just talking about Jesus in time and space, not just talking about the historical Jesus, because remember, Colossians 1.26 says he's Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, Simon Peter said, now, now the misfit, okay? This is the misfit. Uh, this is the guy who, whose teeth marks were on his foot his entire life. Peter didn't know how to shut up. Peter didn't understand discretion. He didn't know how to be quiet. But yet, isn't it amazing? This is the guy. This is the guy, the root, the choice that God made uh, to, to build something. Uh, he's saying, I can work with a guy who's capable of being impetuous. I can work with a guy who, who's not concerned about... You know, remember, Peter got out of the boat against the advice of 11 of the most spiritual people of his day. Uh, it's time sometime for us to step up and to get out of the boat. It's time for us to do something if we do it wrong, because God even makes your mistakes to prosper. We talked about that in a message uh, the, uh, the other day. Uh, God's not afraid of your, your mistakes. Why would you be? Uh, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. It's something we participate in. We must act. And if you'll just act, 
See, you can't solve the problem on the level of the problem. You're worried about what isn't happening in your life. Well, do something that you're not doing. God will step in and bring breakthrough for your life. Whom do men say that I am? Who is he? And who is he on the inside of us? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The son of the living God. Called Abba, Sapa, Kavraba, Shape, Debistite. Uh, and Jesus answers and he says, uh, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And he said, uh, I say unto you that you are Peter, Petros, a stone, a pebble. Uh, and upon this rock or this pebble, I'm going to build something. And the word that to translate, and the gates of hell won't prevail against that which I'm going to, to build. And now, uh, think about the gates of hell. Uh, I don't ever, somebody said I've never seen a gate trying to run and catch up with somebody. Gates are stationary. So is this the church holding the fort till Jesus comes and the gates are out there pounding on the, the entrance to the church? No, he's talking about the church invading earth. The glory of God invading earth. The glory of God invading your life. Those places where uh, the strategies of hell have become entrenched in your life. Wherever that is. In your relationships. In your finances. In your community. In your health. Those areas where the bastions and the bunkers of hell are located in your life or in proximity to your life. The church is designed to be assaulting uh, those barriers to bring in the battering ram of the anointing and the glory of God and the gates of hell will not be able to hold back the invasion of the church whatever that is are we sure we know what that that church is he said I'm going to build my church I'm going to build my church Jesus is the builder and if we will be obeyers he'll be the builder. If we will be obeyers, he, he hasn't called us to, to have all of the answers and to, to be able to solve all the problems. Who's smart enough to do this? Uh, certainly not me. Uh, the Lord woke me up uh, a few days ago, and this is the inspiration of this message. Uh, he woke me up uh, one morning and he told me this. He said, you are not called, Russ, to build the church, but you are called to build into the church. You are called to build into the church. And as I was considering that, I was reminded of a statement by one of my mentors. He said, you're not called to be a builder. You're called to be an obeyer. Now, obeying uh, what? Are we obeying uh, just doing our best? Are we obeying principles of spiritual truth? Uh, what does obedience have to do with? Obedience is really simple. If you, if you learn uh, the obedience by how I'll teach it to you, you could have the IQ of a turnip, and you could still walk in the power of God and the depths of the things of God. Because John 5.19, Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. And I judge or make my decisions as I hear him speak. And you know, God holds himself responsible to see that you know what his voice is. That you know his voice and yet you've heard it clearly. I only do what I see my father do. And uh, how did that work? In John chapter 5, we see Jesus going to the pool of Bethesda. When he went to the pool of Bethesda, there was a, a pool there with five porches. And, a, and an angel would come once a year, and there was a multitude. Now, a multitude, I would say, between 500 and 1,000 of sick people gathered there. And when the angel came down once a year and troubled the water, the first one in got healed. Now, think about that. The first one in got healed. Everybody else just got wet. <laughs> and Jesus shows up, and he heals one guy and left. Now, he only did what he saw the Father do. He prayed for one guy, and he left because he only did what he saw the Father do. And that guy, he insulted him. He'd been there 38 years, 
And Jesus says, uh, excuse me, do you even want to get better? <laughs> and he heals this one guy and he leaves. So he wasn't operating according to a principle of doing good. Otherwise, he would have stayed there and prayed for every single one of them. Now, it's interesting that they were waiting on a move and overlooked a visitation. And I think we're that way. We tend to be like folks who say the power of God, healing, miracles, tongues has all passed away. It's not time for that yet. Because we say, well, I need to get healed. And we say, well, it's not a healing movement right now. That's not what God is doing. So you probably won't get healed. Well, then we're like those at the Pool of Bethesda. We're waiting on an angel. We're waiting on a move of God. But let me tell you something. You have the visitation of God in your life right now. He's on the inside of you. Jesus says... Don't you say, when's the kingdom of God going to come? When are the miracles going to come? When is the move of God going to come to my country, come to my nation, come to my home, my city, my church? Uh, my church is dying on the vine. When are we going to have a move of God? And Jesus said, when people asked him that question, he said, you're not, you're, not only are you not coming up with the right answer, you're not asking the right question. Because these people at the Pool of Bethesda were waiting on a move, and they overlooked a visitation. Jesus says, they say, well, when's this going to happen? He said, look, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. The kingdom of God is when they come to you and they'll say, lo, here is Christ. Lo, there is Christ. He says, don't, don't think like that. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God that's not within you doesn't matter because it's not changing your life. We're not waiting on a time. We're not waiting on a, on a person, but it's what he's put on the inside of us that's going to produce breakthrough. The Lord told me this the other day. He said, uh, what you do with what I've already said is much more powerful than what you're waiting upon me to do or to say. Because it's Christ in you, that's the hope of glory. And Christ in you, the scripture says, if the glory of God says, my God, Philippians 419, my God meets all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And the glory is on the inside of you. So if we can get rightly related to what's on the inside of us and release it out, not only individually but corporately, then we begin to enter into our jurisdiction and we begin to rule and reign in life. And uh, you see, it's the, it's the Christ in you. We're not called to be builders. We're called to be obeyers. But let your obedience be John 5, 19. I only do what I see my father do. And as I hear, I judge. Now, whenever you have a run-up to that, I want to do what I see my father do. Well, Jesus told some people, your father's the devil. <laughs> so you better find out uh, who's your daddy. And, uh, and then when you begin to hear his voice, one of the first things you have to deal with is all of the things in your life that you haven't seen the father do. When God showed this to me 30 years ago, John 5, 19, I spent a lot of time praying, and I pray it still. Father, forgive me, because I can do a lot of things I haven't seen you do. I can lie, I can cheat, I can steal, I can, I can fall short in many ways of the glory of God. We need to have that moment of clarity, that moment of honesty. But then turn and ask the Father, see, if God holds you responsible to hear his voice, then he holds himself responsible to make sure it's heard. And he will speak to you. He'll speak to you through his word. He'll speak to you through prophetic gifts. He'll speak to you through serendipity, synchronicity, through many means. And we do a lot of teaching on this because it's not important that you remember what, what, what we say, but it is necessary for you to know the voice of God in your, own, in your own life. So I can do many things. So Father, forgive us because we can do many things, Lord, that we haven't seen you do. And cleanse us of that activity and give us that moment of clarity that we can do what we see you do. I've told people, I'm not praying for you because I didn't see God heal you. And that may be a little immature. Maybe it was at the time. But I saw a fella get up out of a, out of a, a, a deathbed diagnosis, Lou Gehrig's disease and no hope, get up and walk out healed because I had the integrity to say, God didn't tell me he was going to heal you today. I said, but what I do recommend you do is do what Hezekiah did and turn your face to the wall. Maybe God will give you some more time. And I saw a guy who didn't even know God turn his face to the wall and cry out to God. And instead of dying in a matter of weeks, he was healed and walked out a whole and a free man simply because I determined I was only going to do what I see my father do. 
See, uh, well, I haven't, that isn't the way it's, I've heard it done. Well, things are the way they are because of what we've been doing. If you want something different, you must do something different. It's not enough just to gripe and complain about the state of affairs. If we don't like what we see in the church, church is the way, way it is because of how we do church. And if we want church different, we've got to do church different. If you want something different, you've got to do something different. And, uh, and if we'll listen to his voice, he'll direct and he'll correct. And he will build. And he'll take misfits like you and me. I'm, misfits. He says he chooses the foolish things. So why are we trying to get so smart? He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The base things of the world. He, choo he didn't choose Peter because he was so qualified. He chose Peter because he was not qualified. He chose Peter because he was a misfit. He told Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. So whenever he sat at the Last Supper and said, one of you is going to betray me, if they were going to pick one out, he'd already called Peter a devil. Don't you know they all looked at Peter and thought, you know, if it's anybody, it's going to be him because Jesus said he was a devil. It wasn't it interesting that these people had a, listen folks, they had a kononia between them. So much so that even though they were from very different backgrounds, and these guys did not get along, they bickered for three and a half years. But by the time Jesus got them to the Last Supper, and he said, one of you is going to betray me. They all looked and said, Lord, is it I? In other words, they weren't quick to judge. They weren't quick to accuse uh, one another or accuse someone else or to excuse themselves. Let's have that. Let's have that level of kononia. Let's allow him to build his purpose in us. You see, it's the Christ in you who is the builder. We're just called to be the obeyer. Now, how does he build? He builds out from where he is. Well, where is he? He's in your spirit. He's building out from your spirit into his purposes. He's not just building himself into you so uh, you can go through life uh, not much different than people that don't even know God and then go to heaven when you die. No, he is building out himself, out. He's on the inside of you. He's building himself out of your human spirit into his purposes in the earth. The spirit of God on the inside of you builds out from your human spirit and your soul is put in a position to obey. Your spirit is the builder by the anointing of God and your soul is the obeyer. Your humanity, listen, your humanity, we're, we try, we're trying to jettison what he wants to work with. We're trying to jettison what he wants to work with. You're all, he, you may not be much. <laughs> you, like I told somebody this morning, I said, I just want to be the ass that the Lord rides in on. <laughs> I just want to be, you know, we, we, maybe we don't like who God uses, but think about Balaam. You know, uh, God, the only thing God had to work with to talk to Balaam was an ass, was a jackass that he was riding. And uh, if he would have said, no, I don't think, uh, Mr. Ass, that you have the credibility to uh, speak the word of the Lord to me, well, it wouldn't have turned out too well for him. So let's have that in ourselves, not worried about how we look or how perfect we are. Just make yourself available. As my father preached a message years ago, talked about being bendable, sendable, and spendable. Uh, let's just make ourselves available because you're all he's got to work with in that portion of his purposes represented by your life. And he's not willing to do it without you. And it's okay if you're a misfit. Uh, and it's okay even if you don't know you're a misfit. He'll still work with you. Your humanity represents his chosen building materials and under his hand. Now listen. Under his hand, he said he was going to build something. What's he building? He's building church. But the word church there is the word ecclesia. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Because what church, the word for church, where the word church comes from, that was around in Jesus' day, but he did not choose that word. He did not choose the word that the translators chose. He used another word called ecclesia. And the two words mean something entirely different from one another. And it's interesting that they did that. That the, 
the uh, translators coming out of the Middle Ages, where the church was a building and an institution, chose that word, even though that word was around in Jesus' day, but he didn't use it. He used another one. That meant something else entirely. Let's find out what church is. So that under his hands, as a member of his purposes, as a component of God's purpose, you become a component of the governmental architecture that Jesus intends in his purpose to rule and reign on the earth. When you allow the Spirit of God on the inside of you to be the builder and your soul to be the obeyer, I don't have to have all the answers, I just need to obey then you create a Matthew 18 agreement between your spirit and your soul and nothing shall be impossible to you. That's what media church is all about. And this isn't just plugging media church, but you're here so I get to talk about it. Uh, we may not at, at this juncture, media church may not be that church, that governmental component, but we want to be a testament to that church. And hopefully in months and years to come, we'll get to be a candidate for that jurisdictional church that rules and reigns of the earth. At the very least, we want to start a conversation about where God is taking us as a people. You see, God is challenging us to give up church as we know it in order to participate in church as he wants it. God is challenging us to give up church as we know it in order to participate in church as he wants it. We want to be a people who are building into God's purpose. God told me it's not my job to build the church, but I am called to build into his church, into his purposes. You know, there's just about a thousand people in a, who've signed up to media church at one level or another. What if you could call on that body of people and they knew how to pray and they knew their jurisdiction and they would pray for you in a 24-hour cycle? How different would your life be? There was a church that way. There was a church that was just that way in Antioch in Acts chapter 13. This was a people who understood their governmental jurisdiction and they acted. They acted in a spirit of conquest to take territory that Jesus died to give them. Now let's read Acts chapter 13. There were, verse 1, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Cyrene, Manan, uh, and Saul. Notice they put Saul last. Misfit. <laughs> yeah, Saul was there. Uh, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them, and they sent them away. Now, look what they did. They had a group of people who were listening to God. They came together, and they chose by the Spirit of God's leading two men that they sent out. That was a pattern that was not unfamiliar to them. It was not unfamiliar to them to know of a group of men, or men and women in our day, a group of people who would come together, select some from among them to send them out to a special purpose. That idea did not, was familiar to them not in the realm of religion, but it was familiar to them from the secular realm because they knew that's how armies were raised in that day. Ancient Greek culture and ancient Roman culture. They would bring a group of soldiers together, of warriors together, and they would, those warriors would select a man or a group of men from among them. They would call them apostolos. Sound familiar? It, they, the body of men was called the ecclesia and the the one that they would choose was called the apostolos. And the word apostolic means from the fleet. Because what this group of people would do, they would come together, they would choose an apostolos, they would then finance themselves, they would finance and build a fleet, and they would man that fleet to follow the apostolos into war and conquest. 
And uh, so whenever the Acts 13 church came together and chose Saul, they were acting as in a pattern that was familiar to a secular process that they all knew quite well, even though in religion they had never seen this. The term ecclesia is an is a secular term. Now, what if you and I comprised a company of battle-ready believers? That was the vision of the early church. That's why Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. He said, ecclesia. The ecclesia was a secular term in that day. It was a governing body of experienced soldiers who came together to declare war and determine strategy. And for them, defeat was never an option. You see, we want to build into this purpose. We want to build into the church. We don't want to do our thing. We want to build into God's thing. And as a result, you and I are both going to be the beneficiaries. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. And this is more uh, teaching uh, for this, this next part. It doesn't take a per person with any great insight to know that the church and Christianity as a whole has been going through some uncomfortable transitions. In Western Europe, Christianity has been waning for decades. In the United States, 30% of people surveyed by the Pew Research Foundation are religiously unaffiliated. 80% of all those who consider themselves unaffiliated or what they call nuns, they would mark none, that's no, no affiliation. Uh, they're not even looking for a religion that be, would be right for them. George Barna of the Barna Research Foundation, he predicts at the current rate of decline that the religious demographic of the United States is going to match that of Western Europe within 10 years. Uh, one writer addressing this statistic of decline warns this. He said, as a people, Christians better wake up and recover cultural relevance or we're going to become like the Amish and people will drive by our churches and remark how quaint we are. You see, Christian culture is adrift. It is in our best interest then to begin to look again at the rudiments of our faith and to discover if there is some way we can realign our thinking and our practice with those Christians who in earlier centuries were so effective at influencing the world around them. Those that have turned the world upside down have come here also. There's no other time in history beyond the first century that maintained a higher level of influence on civilization than the early church. They saw signs, miracles, wonders. Where's the signs? Where's the miracles? Where we're going to have one here tonight. Molly is going to get the touch of God in her life. Cancers are going to be healed tonight. People's lives are going to be changed because we're going to come together. We're going to have a moment of clarity here as a group. I want you to be ready. And we're going to rule and reign. We're going to come together like Acts 13. Think about it. This guy came together who changed history, changed the West as we know it. They took the biggest misfit among them. And they came together as an ecclesia, accepting the jurisdiction that Jesus gave them. And they took the least likely one among them, the guy who had messed it up big time. And they sent him out just to show what was possible. That moment of clarity, we're going to rule, we're going to reign. It's our portion. And fortunately for us, we have the record of Scripture to reliably tell us how the early Christians thought and what they did that made them such a powerful force. We don't have to sit back and wonder, where's the days of miracles? No, if we'll follow their template, we will walk into the days of miracles once again. Uh, for this teaching and for the sake of brevity, I, uh, when you look at this statement by Jesus about his purpose and what he expected to see his followers involve themselves in, he made it very plain in this verse here in Matthew chapter 16. He's going to build his church. What was it he intended to build. Now we're going to get uh, we're going to get technical about some words here, but we don't want to say, well, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? But word, these words mean something. Jesus said he would build something that he identified with the Greek word ekklesia. 
Now that's a very specific choice of words, and it's been diluted down by our culture. Ecclesia, or does it mean to us what it meant to Jesus' hearers and what it meant to him when he chose that term? Because of the passage of time, we have very little understanding of what Jesus meant or how his listeners took what he said when he spoke of building an ecclesia. We will therefore look briefly at Jesus' statement, and we're going to compare it with the translations of our day. We're not going to get too theological, but we're going to try and make this plain and try to find out and correct the disparity between our understanding and what Jesus actually meant and how his hearers would have most likely have interpreted what he said. Now again, Matthew 16, 18, I say unto you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and the word there is ecclesia, and the gates of hell. He's talking about a militant church, a ruling and reigning church, a jurisdictional church, a governmental component of the kingdom of God. See, this statement would have been of keen interest to those who followed the life of Jesus because Jesus was inscrutable to most of them. He was hard to figure out or to understand what his agenda was. They tried to make him king, and he refused. They tried to make him declare himself openly as the Messiah, and he refused. The man was an enigma, even to his most devoted followers. It took the Holy Ghost for them to figure him out. <laughs> they didn't really get him until they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Uh, now, he states his purpose very plainly. He says, I'm going to build an ecclesia. Now, what did that mean to the people listening at the time? In our English Bibles, the translators used the word church. Now, here we go. The old English word for church is Kirk, Captain Kirk. How about that? And it, and it means a house that belongs to a Lord. The word Kirk, interestingly enough, you know this word was around in Jesus' day and it arises out of a Greek meaning. Uh, we might wonder why Jesus didn't use this word to describe what he was building when this term was available. He had a choice. Uh, the word is kyriakon doma. When he was trying to say, how am I going to tell these yahoos, you know, <laughs> he's, he's sitting there. He's got the biggest misfit in front of him. He knows he's going to be telling him, get thee behind me, Satan, in two or three days. And he's got his guys, and they're arguing, and they're not getting along, and they're worried about uh, things that I'd not to be worried about. And in his mind, he's thinking, how am I going to tell these guys what I'm building? Am I going to use, am I going to say I'm building a curia condoma, which means the Lord's house? Or am I going to tell them I'm building an ecclesia? He chose to tell them he was building an ecclesia. Why did the translators later take the Greek language, and see ecclesia and say, well, let's say Kyria Condoma. Why? Because the people wouldn't understand it otherwise? Maybe in uh, the, when the English Bible was being translated, they didn't want the Christians to see themselves as an army of God with jurisdictional authority because we, they wanted the king to be in charge. See, we don't, hey, we don't want these people thinking they have jurisdiction. <laughs> so Jesus... Now we know Jesus didn't speak Greek. Okay, he didn't. He would not have used the Greek language anyway, uh, as it was more likely his native tongue was Aramaic. Now, do we have Aramaic versions of the Bible? Well, the most popular Aramaic version of the Bible is the Peshatta, translated into English by George Lamsa. So we ought to be able to look at the transliteration of this word in the Aramaic text and know what word Jesus used, right? Well, actually, no, because the oldest Aramaic manuscripts we know were translations of an early Greek manuscript. So we come back to the only word available to us was ecclesia, not curia condoma. It was ecclesia. So the translators were working from spoken Aramaic into the in the original words of Jesus to written Greek and later into written Aramaic again. Therefore, the earliest reliable word we have for what Jesus said he would build is again coming back to ecclesia. And I don't just mean to be technical, but, but these things need to be understood. We could guess at what Aramaic word Jesus might have used. It's possible he used the Aramaic word nista or atra, 
The word nista is the Aramaic equivalent of the Hebrew word synagogue. Isn't it interesting that he did, it was unlikely this is the word Jesus used because the early church never followed the pattern of the synagogue in spite of the fact it was a perfectly good Jewish religious system and all the disciples were Jewish. But they did not build the early church after the pattern of the synagogue that had been around for a thousand years. So, we don't have any proof of the what exact Aramaic word Jesus used. However, based upon history and what Jesus' followers proceeded to do, we can conclude that the most reliable term is not an Aramaic guess, Nista or Atra, or an English approximation, church or kirk, from the Greek Kyriakon Doma, but the Greek word ekklesia. And the Greek word ekklesia is a far cry in definition from the word church. But the translators used it because they didn't want people seeing themselves as a legislative body, a governmental component of the purposes of God. They wanted them to know they are belonging to a Lord. That's what Kiri Kondoma means. He, and the Lord, in their eyes, was not Jesus. It was the king. So, what does it matter what translation we use to express what Jesus actually said in Matthew 16, 18? Normally, it would matter very little because by and large the translators most commonly of our most commonly used Bibles have done a very good job of communicating to us the intent of Scripture. Can you feel the, I, I don't know about you, but I can feel the cancer getting worried right about now because he, he the, that spirit of that cancer knows there is a jurisdictional authority upon the people of God to uh, excise him from the lives of those that are suffering. When you realize that the word church originates from a term that is available, that was available to the sacred writers in Jesus' day, the original manuscripts, you have to ask why. They did not use the term Kyria Kondoma or Lord's House in their writings. Perhaps it does because it does not adequately or accurately convey what Jesus meant when he said he was going to build something. Now, we know they didn't use this term because it's not found in any of the ancient manuscripts containing the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, 18. The word found in these ancient texts is almost without exception, ecclesia. The term kirikondoma is translated into English as the Lord's house. And we call our church today the house of the Lord or the Lord's house. And in the Old Testament, uh, the writers referred to the Jewish temple as the house of the Lord. You can see that in Psalm 23, 6, Ezra 7, 27. So the idea of an actual building as a center of worship, it's a practical one, and it was common a thousand years before Jesus, but yet he didn't use those terms to describe it. I'm not anti-church building. Don't get me wrong. Uh, if you're going to gather people together for religious instruction, the most common sense way to do it is in a building specifically constructed for that purpose. But at this point, let me say that this is not intended to disparage or deconstruct the current forms and manners by which we worship. But as it has been put, when we look at Christianity, we can but conclude when we look at the church, there ain't nothing wrong, but something ain't right. <laughs> so let's focus again on the actual words of Jesus. And to bring us as a people to come back into a clarity of what Jesus actually died to bring about. He did not go to the cross to establish a religious system or to put buildings with steeples on every street corner. Don't get me started on steeples. Uh, from Nehemiah's time, we had a perfectly good religious system and buildings to serve its purpose throughout the Mediterranean. And in this day we live in, God is asking us to surrender church as we know it, for church as he wants it. Change, brothers and sisters, is upon us. And we either cling to the familiar or we yield to the Lordship of Christ to become something more than we know and thereby grow into a modern-day, robust, culture-confronting force in the earth. Now, the term ecclesia and apostolos were not religious terms in Jesus' day. What did Jesus intend to build? Whatever his purpose was, he used the term ecclesia to describe it. Now this is, again, it's not a religious term. Neither was the term apostle. 
I know I'm repeating, but, but these are unusual. These are things we're not familiar with. These were secular terms, not unknown to the ancient world. When Jesus said ecclesia, the people didn't look at each other questioning what he meant. They knew instantly what he meant because the term was well known to them. The term ecclesia was common both in Roman and Greek culture. It described a body of men called together, a body of soldiers called together for governmental purpose. <laughs> that being the case, we might compare it today with our Congress or our Parliament. But this, however, would not be entirely correct. Because the ecclesia in both Roman and Greek culture, it was indeed a legislative body, but its primary purpose was militaristic. So a civil body, a legislative body, wouldn't quite fit it. Uh, the ecclesia was made up of a body of soldiers with at least two years military experience who came together, listen, to declare war, and to plan military strategy. We're declaring war on cancer. We're declaring war on Molly's cancer in Nevada. They could not conduct business. It's interesting that this group of people could not conduct business unless they were a quorum of 6,000 members. I have a vision for a 6,000 member ecclesia that we could call on in a day to pray and see miracles come in a day. When declaring war, they would choose a leader and they would finance the building of a fleet of ships, which they themselves would then man and follow their apostolus into conquest. As an apostolus or a sent one, it means from the fleet. So when Jesus said he was building an ecclesia, there was the immediate implication of an apostolus. And so Acts 13, they came together and they elected Paul. See, they knew when Jesus said ecclesia that he wasn't calling a sowing bee. <laughs> Every person listening to Jesus knew that his words were a prelude to war. Now listen, let's, let's conclude. We, we could talk at this at length. Jesus did not die to seat you in an audience. He died to conscript you into an army. You have rank. You have jurisdiction. His government is upon your shoulders. You are a principality and a power in the earth. And as you choose to convene yourselves with others of like authority, then you exponentially bring pressure to bear upon the powers of darkness that have lobbied for so long to deny you the victor's crown. Lives will be changed, families transformed, cities taken for God and nations brought to heal under the purposes of God that will not be controverted because there is an ecclesia present in the earth whose members understand that it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. saith the Lord. This is what the Antioch church understood. And in so doing, they took two misfits from their ranks and sent them out as a governmental decree of the kingdom. And all of civilization, listen, in that little prayer meeting in Antioch that day, all of civilization was transformed from that day till this because they went out as sent ones. So I say to you, by the Spirit of God, take your place. Stand up in your rank in Christ. Refuse to be denied. Reject passivity and doubt. And begin to connect with those fellow regents of the kingdom, wherever they may be found. We will then see church as we have seen it transformed into church as God intends it. And the whole earth, brothers and sisters, will rejoice in the outpoured glory that results. Now, in that understanding, let's come together and have a moment of clarity. Now, let's focus right now on Molly in Nevada. She has a cancer in her body. You agree with me? Matthew 18, 
Nothing shall be denied us. You cancer, you foul spirit of cancer, I command you. The ecclesia of God commands you. The ecclesia where Jesus dwells. The ecclesia that is the repository of all the power that Jesus released on Calvary commands you. Release this woman and be gone. We speak to cancer in the lives of every person represented by this ecclesia that's convened here today. We command cancer be gone. We speak to you by the authority of the resources of Christ provided in Calvary and invested in us as a governmental body upon the earth. We bring the blood of Christ against you and cancer we banish you. We banish you. We command you to be gone, to loose these bodies of the, those thus diagnosed. And we declare them free. We bring a release of freedom and a miracle, a moment of a miracle yes. right now in the name of Jesus. Right. <sighs> Receive your rank today. Receive your rank. God's calling Joel's army. You know, we have a vision to raise up a thousand prophets into prophetic office and to raise up a 6,000 member ecclesia. I, I, I haven't talked much about it because it's something that only God can do. But we have a vision. And that's part of it, what, what we're doing, the context of what we're doing. And we release that vision to you today. Soto Brava Sata. Imagine a body, a body of, uh, of uh, a 6,000 member ecclesia coming together to do business for God. Soto Brava Sata. That we send out a, a broadcast text or an email and everyone prays. And you know how to pray. I'm not talking about people that don't even know who Jesus is and they call themselves Christians. I'm talking about people who know how to and they come together and focus upon one situation, one circumstance. Nations would be brought to heal. Cities would be changed. Rulers would tremble at that ecclesia. God is raised. Maybe, maybe I won't ever get to participate in that. But let me tell you something, I stand here, my wife and I, we stand here as a testament to that ecclesia in the yes, earth. Yes. God is raising up that body in the earth. And we invite you to join that, that vision with us. May, you may feel like you're Don Quixote charging at windmills, but let me tell you something. <laughs> God is in us. And he's taking his authority, and you and I are a part of it. It's been an honor. It's been an honor to wash your feet today. I, I encourage you to, to connect with us. Um, give us some feedback on the broadcast today. Pray for Russ and Kitty. Pray for us. Pray for Father's Heart Ministry. Pray for the ecclesia of God that he's raising up in the earth. It's a new day, folks. It's a new day. And you and I have the honor and the privilege to be a part of it. In about two weeks, we'll be having the War Room event. And we'll be sending out invitations to that. I urge you, we're primarily when we come there, it's just ruling and reigning. Prayer is not begging and pleading. Prayer is ruling and reigning. Uh, come be a part of that. We bless you. We love you. We look forward to connecting with you again. God bless.